4 developers, 4 games, 1 asset pack, and 48 hours. Welcome to the second Sinti Jam, the challenge in which Sinti Studios kindly provided me and the others access to the Fantasy Kingdom's asset pack and challenged us to make a game with it in 48 hours or less. Before we get into the games we each made, I just want to mention the store-wide sale that Sinti are having right now until May 15th. You can see a selection of the deals you will find here. Plus, each week of the sale, a new pack will be 70% off, so be sure to check back regularly. All the relevant links will obviously be in the description below. And with all that said, let's get to the games, starting with Nathan. Greetings, travellers. I've been invited by personal invitation by Dan himself to uh, participate in this game gem of sorts. But I don't want to make things easy for myself. So instead of having this helm, I'm thinking of replacing it with something a little bit more futuristic. So let's head inside the castle and get started, shall we? Oh boy, you're not gonna lie, that gambus and armor is, is heavy. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is a pretty modern inside castle interior. I'll give it that. Even got LEDs here, that's, that's, that's pretty schmick. Anyways, it has been quite a while since I last delved into VR game development and I thought this jam as a good opportunity to test the waters again uh, for the tool set. Because I was curious to see if the same bottlenecks and roadblocks were still apparent two years later. And so I begun this journey by using Unity's VR Core um, starter project and then quickly imported the assets needed for this jam. I then quickly got to work brainstorming ideas that I thought would be interesting, both with using some of the incredible art assets for this jam, as well as the different medium of virtual reality. Now I've played a lot of VR and some of my favorite stuff being first person, especially, you know, shooters. But I felt that even ignoring the scope of this jam, I wanted to try something a little bit different. And especially after exploring some of the castle scenes in the art assets, I thought this is just calling for a miniature gameplay experience. And so I got one of the main scenes, put in an XR rig, shrunk all the assets down, and that, my friends, is where things stopped being easy. Now, I really wanted to recreate the Pavlov VR spectator controllers, you know, that use the joysticks to move around, as well as the grip buttons to kind of pull and drag, as well as zoom in and out. However, despite that, I couldn't get it to work. In fact, I couldn't get any input to work because the tutorials I was watching were over a year old. And for some reason, in the past recent updates, they've reworked everything. So all those tutorials are useless unless you use that old toolkit version. Fantastic. I had eventually got to a desperate point where I started to download um, different SDKs. I did download the Oculus SDK and look, it was a nice SDK, but when trying to make custom input again, it was not easy. And so I ended up reverting to just Unity's default XR input system to try to get these, these controllers to read something, anything. And you know, while all this is happening, I still haven't thought up an idea for my game. And so in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what can I make in scope and time, especially since I'm losing so much, trying to just get a simple trigger or button to be registered. What am I gonna make? Would I be controlling a character like we've seen in some PSVR games? Would you be sneaking around the castle, you know, doing some espionage or something cool like that? Or would you be talking to those living in the castle and doing quests for them, you know, you're doing jobs or whatever. But this control scheme was being such an issue, I knew the more time it would take to make this work, the less time I'd have on the actual game idea. But there was a particular moment when I was in the VI headset, looking across the castle walls and thinking over my hopelessness and, and my self-doubt. I saw all the details in this world, how complex and refined the trees were from the towers to the homes. And in that moment, I was reminded of someone. Now, you may know him by a different name, but in my country, we call him Wally. And yes, this is something I could make within scope. I could use characters, which is something a commenter from the previous game Jen mentioned, and set up ways for players to find them. Now remember at this point, my time has been far spent on the controls and you know, XR 
input that I am not going to have the time for a giant crowd set piece. But something more along the lines of like a hide and seek, an adventure, exploration, click and find type thing. Yeah, that could be fun. That can be interesting. I can I can maybe even add some humor in there as well. But once controller input was being picked up by the engine, I was able to put in a little to-do list for players to read when they press down the grippy grip button. They could see a little to-do list, kind of like in uh, Untitled Goose Game. And then I added the little interaction uh, by adding a collider and trigger and registering the input for the triggers. So when players kind of went near a character and selected them, it gave them a little, little firework, a little cheer, you know, some positive reinforcement for finding the thing that they're meant to find in this empty landscape of a world. And so with placing the characters around the world and adding a game over screen and also an input where, you know, if you hold it down, then it'll eventually quit the game. Because you see, I never got around to the whole UI pointer interaction system. That just, mm, we're not having time for that in this jam. Mm. But with those workarounds, I managed to fit the game within scope and time. Now, I do want to end my segment by saying, I know it might seem like I waste a lot of time with like the input system and just little nitty gritty stuff, but I'm actually really glad I took the opportunity to participate in this game jam and to actually do something I've been wanting to experiment with for a while. I think this is why we do game jams to begin with, is to experiment with ideas, take risks on things that maybe we don't want to invest as much time in. Because now I know for a certainty that Unity VR has the exact same issues it had two years ago when I basically bailed on it because it was being too frustrating. YouTube tutorials become redundant faster than a Unity render pipeline. And despite how engaging it is to play VR games, it is still a headache to actually make them. The only way I can make a VR game in Unity is to make everything from scratch and have all the time in the world to do it. Which is unrealistic, I know. But that's all from me today. Thank you all for watching my segment. Now on to the next dev. Hey guys, I'm Silverly B. I'm a game dev here on YouTube and I was very excited to be invited by Den for another asset packet gem with the Fantasy Kingdom pack made by Sinji. Just looking at the demo scene, I felt very inspired to create a fantasy, medieval world filled with magic and secrets. I knew I wanted to try things and do a game mode that I'd never done before, so I decided to create a first person shooter. It's the first time I work on something like this in 3D and honestly, I don't consume many games in this genre, especially not action games, so it was a novelty to me. I decided that the main character would be a warlock that could conjure fireballs to throw at enemies and objects. To get things going, I started the project with the Unity first person template, so the character movement was already set up. That was honestly my first mistake because it uses the new input system and as an old input system user, I hated it. It did serve as a learning lesson though, so I'm glad I went with it. I then created a playground using some of the assets to test out the mechanics of the game. To make the fireball, I used the catapult effect and just tweaked it a little bit so it fit better as a spell that the player was casting. The special effect already came complete, so it looks really awesome when it hits something. I made it so that some objects are destructible, while other objects are not, and it feels satisfying to destroy the targets and see the fireball in action. I also worked on the sound design and the animations, but because it's an FPS, I decided to remove the animation and just give the player a pose, so you won't see its shadow T-posing throughout the game. My thought process with this playground was very simple. I focused first on the mechanics and making the game feel good to play, and later I worked on the levels. I'm glad I did this, because it allowed me to work on things that I usually neglect, such as the sound design. It wasn't perfect, but I managed to add footsteps, the fireball sound, and a different sound for the hit depending on whether you destroyed the object or not. I'm happy with how it turned out, especially since my games don't usually have any sound. With all of that done, it was time to start working on the levels and the storyline. I created this really complex storyline where you'd go through different rooms and face different puzzles, finding notes that would tell this immersive, totally cool, never before seen story. To create the dozens of notes I'd spread around the levels, I turned to the one and only friend that could help me, ChatGPT. And by friend, I mean bot, of course. I totally have an anthropomorphized ChatGPT and developed a trusting relationship with an AI that would be weird. 
Anyways, my plan then was to create the rooms and their puzzles in the most basic way possible first and once all of them were finished, I'd go back and work on the details and decorations of each room. I went on to create the first room and develop the note system, even added a couple notes to the game. But as I reached the second room, I realized I wouldn't have time to create the dozens of scenes I had imagined. So I decided to scrap the notes part, forget the other rooms, and focus on making the two levels I'd completed look nice and finished. The first room is very creative. It is a prison and you have to try and escape it. It's just a simple puzzle, nothing too complicated, just things like a locked cell, a locked door and such. Still, I like how it turned out. I especially like things like this barrel right here that drops arrows once it's destroyed. It's so cute, it makes destroying things so fun. And then the second room ended up being the most time consuming. The idea for this room came from this part of the demo scene where you have a nice little romantic chapel. I thought it looked pretty, so I just snatched it and put it on a floating island. My first idea was to make a parkour path from the ground all the way to the sky, but I quickly changed my mind and changed the scene to look like two floating islands above the clouds. I'm happy I did it because I think it looks much better and the path is more manageable. Even so, because it's basically a parkour level, in order to make sure that the level worked, I had to test it out and try to climb all the way to the top. Have I mentioned before that I don't usually play 3D first-person games? Anyways, after many failed attempts, I can say for sure that even for someone as bad at it as me, it's still doable, which means it might be too easy for some people. I then made the bottom of the floating islands look cooler. There are many ways I could improve on this level, but I really like how it turned out. I also like how the fireballs explode on the rocks. I think it looks so cool. At last, I made a simple menu an end menu and got into a fist fight with the new input system so that they could work. And that was the end of the 48 hours. It's not very much an FPS because the shooter part doesn't really exist, you just shoot objects, but I'm really happy with how it turned out as this first person puzzle game. And I'll probably be updating the game to add other rooms and tell the story properly through the notes. Thank you then for putting the jam together and inviting me. This was super fun and I definitely learned a lot. Hey, this is James Makes Games, and when Dan challenged me to make a game in 48 hours using the Fantasy Kingdom Asset Pack, I knew I couldn't say no. First, I looked at some of the assets in the pack for inspiration, and I nearly lost the run of myself. There's honestly so many games I wanted to make, but after looking through the character and weapon assets, I decided to make a game centered around combat. I considered a third person game where the player can explore the demo scene provided by Sinti, but realized I had no chance of finishing that in 48 hours. Instead, I decided to remake a smaller, popular game, Rock, Paper, Scissors. My version would just use Light Attack, Heavy Attack, and Block as moves instead. Light beats Heavy, Heavy beats Block, Block beats Light. There's only one small problem with this, Rock, Paper, Scissors is mostly chance-based. So, I decided the opponent should broadcast their move before they make it, and give the player a chance to react. Now that I knew what I wanted to make, I had to start building it. First, I had to create a basic level scene. To save time, I reused the demo scene provided by Sinti, and found a nice spot where the battle could take place. Next, I created prefabs for the player and opponent, and placed them on the map. I spent some time picking out idle and attack animations for each move, then put them together in a very basic but messy animation controller. Finally, it was onto my favourite part, the code. I created an enum to handle the attacks, and added an extension method to find what move beats another. Then, I created a battle manager script to, well, manage the battle. On start, it sets the player and opponent's idle, then starts a countdown via the code routine. During the countdown, the opponent move is selected, and when the timer reaches zero, the round is over and the attack animation plays. Finally, we check who the winner is and print it to the console. In the scene, I added buttons to select the player move and hooked them up to the battle manager. And there we have it, a very basic battle with one round. A battle with one round is pretty boring, so it was time to create multiple rounds. To make this easier, I replaced the core routines with C-sharp tasks, since I had more experience with them. I started by adding two timers, time between rounds and time before battle. This was to give the player enough time to get their bearings before the opponent started attacking them. I also added hit points for the player and opponent and deducted them based on who won each round. After working for a while, I started to make some changes to the code to make it a bit cleaner. I used scriptable objects to hold all the information about the battle since the battle manager class was going to have too many fields. I also extracted all the shared data for the player and opponent into a combatant class. I tried to follow a clean as you go approach when writing the code for the challenge. Even though these code changes seem small, they really helped me work a lot faster. At this stage, there was no concept of game state visible to the player. There was no way of knowing when the round would end or who was even winning, so I started working on the UI elements. 
added a UI slider to act as a timer gauge for each round. Then I added health bars to the top of the screen, one in green for the player and one in red for the opponent, and then reshuffled the UI a small bit. But what good is a game if you can't win or lose? So I added two texts to the UI, one for game over and one for game one. Then I enabled these at the end of each battle, depending on the player and opponent hit points. Finally, I picked out a celebration and defeat animation and added them to the animation controller. After that, it was obviously the player who won the battle. Six hours to go and I had a functional game ready to be played. There was just one small problem. It wasn't fun. There was no sense of difficulty or progression. There was always enough time to pick the winning move and it never felt like the player was being challenged. To fix this, I decided to reduce the round timer after each round, forcing the player to react faster to the opponent's broadcasting. In the script of logic, I added maximum round time, minimum round time, and round time interval change. The idea being that when the battle starts, the round length starts at the maximum, then reduces by the interval change until it reaches the minimum. I also added opponent reaction time as a percentage. This is 25% here, so once 25% of the round time has elapsed, the opponent will broadcast their move. So now, the longer you play, the less time you have to react to the opponent's move, making it more challenging. Time is really running out now, and the game was lacking polish. I started by converting the main camera to cinema machine, and aligning the camera to give a more cinematic angle. Then, I added post processing to the project, adding depth of field to blur the background, and then vignette and tone mapping to get the film look. Finally, I added noise to the cinema machine camera to give it a natural swaying motion. Now, all I need to do was teach the player how to play the game, so I added some tutorial screens to the UI. And finally, I created a replay button to reset the battle and let the player try again. All that was left was to build the game and publish to itch.io. This is my first game jam, and probably the biggest game dev challenge I've ever faced. If I could only share one piece of advice from this experience, it would be to use assets. They're a massive time saver, a source of inspiration, and can help you make up for any skills you may be lacking. Thanks to Dan for inviting me to this challenge. And with that, I'll hand you over to our next game dev. So the first thing I did was import the asset pack and take a look at the demo scene to see what I was working with. I had an idea of the game I wanted to create already, uh, but I've not actually seen the assets before, so this was a good chance to just get familiar with kind of what was available in the pack. And the kind of game that I want to work on here is a kind of townscaper-esque sort of game where it's no goals or anything, you're just building a nice little town. So just placing down buildings and making a nice little scene. I started off trying to make the game isometric, but I ended up swapping this to just normal perspective because I didn't really like the way it was looking. And then I started to lay out a plane for the ground and put a building in the center just so I could get a sense of the kind of scale of stuff that I was working with. With this done, I coded it so we could start to place buildings and that simple act was quite fun and addictive. So I think we were off to a good start. I then limited uh, how you could place items so they couldn't overlap with other items and had a little bit of a material change to show that visually. And then to allow for zoom levels for the camera, I installed Cinemachine, because uh, that's got a really nice blending feature where it automatically blends between multiple virtual cameras. So that was all working nicely. Uh, I love Cinemachine. And now for the UI, I really wanted the player to be able to pick the specific building that they were going to place. But to do that, you need thumbnails for every single image. And we were playing with a lot of assets here in only 48 hours. So the thought of going through and taking... Uh, thumbnails for so many different objects I just there was no time for that so I ended up scrapping that and in the end the kind of best I could do was just some buttons along the bottom that uh, pick a random item from each of the categories so you never know what you're gonna get but you can just right click to cancel placement and get it again if you don't like the kind of style of building that was chosen for you and with that I added the categories of building foliage decoration and paths so the final thing to do on my to-do list was implement some audio. So I added a kind of dig sound when you place the items and gave it a bit of random pitch every time it plays to make sure it doesn't sound just the same monotonous kind of sound all the time. And I added some nice medieval kind of background music. And there we have it. That's all I really had time for uh, this time around in the kind of two days time that I had. In the last jam, I spent a bit longer tweaking it after the fact, but this time, don't have time. Go into a wedding. This video's got to get out there eventually. So yeah, that was my contribution to the Cinti jam. Thanks again to the team over at Cinti for providing us with access to this pack. Be sure to go to the links in the description and check out the Cinti sale, which is running to the 15th of May with some really big savings. All the links to that are obviously in the description below. And there'll also be links there to everyone's games as well as uh, their YouTube channels. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.